remember talking through Keisha the other day yeah. on the water week. Yes. <laughs> We're trying to come up with all kinds of solutions around it. This is the fishing base. Is that right? That's fishing man. I ain't got to go. He's going Saturday. Come on Saturday. I was in North Carolina all the way past where you know. We didn't realize the chillers that made that yeah. water. You know, that's part of being on the bottom. That's a bunch of water. Well, yeah. the rest of it we can manage through. But you yeah. have that big ass guy. That's all. So we're going to go this way. We're going to go this way. We're going to go this way. We're trying to put off in the. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 
But I guess we'll go ahead and start. Maybe, maybe the mayor will be here in a minute. Uh, you, for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Lamb. I'm the Emergency Management Agency Director for Marion County. Uh, I work for the, for the mayor's office, is where I, I report to as a county employee. And today's, uh, I can't tell you how proud I am to see y'all. The uh, we wrote our first hazard mitigation plan in 2014, and we, we always had, back then we had to have an official public hearing. This is a public discussion for the, for the record today, and Rhonda had asked if she could record this. It's a public meeting. I hope nobody's offended by that, but she wants to record it. It is a public meeting, so she's welcome to do so. And I think she's going to rebroadcast it on the Facebook page. I will. Anybody can share it at once, too. Okay. So anyway, in 2014, we wrote our first plan and we had a public hearing. And I called a friend, but she's actually my public information officer right now. Now, Louise Powell, I called Louise and said, would you please come to our, our public hearing because we don't have anybody here. Nobody showed up to the public hearing. We'd advertised it through the paper. We'd done everything. The plan has to be renewed every five years. So five years later, in 2019, we went through all the notifications. Again, the same thing happened. Uh, the metrics change with these plans uh, from time to time because they, they, the plan is regulated by FEMA. And so this year, we actually started our planning for this update. Come on in. Just sign in and have a seat. No, I'm sorry. Sign in so you can just go ahead and take a, take a chair wherever you want. So anyway, Actually, a year ago tomorrow, we started our 2024 update for the hazard mitigation plan. We had a meeting on October the 11th last year. Uh, Keith and I, we went to every post office, we went to the banks, we went to every public building, we went to the same lots, we went everywhere and posted notices for a public hearing for the hazard mitigation review because it is a public plan. And we had that meeting on October the 11th and we had the, some city officials show up. We didn't have anybody. Subsequently, after that, I was I was on a web web conference with a team of, of new people for the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency. And a, uh, a, uh, the presenter said, we're doing our plans wrong because we get in the back room and we get with the cities, we make the plans up and we publish them. And there's no disrespect to your cities, but that's the way it was always been done. He said, you need to engage the public somehow. You got to get the public involved in these plans. So uh, my team, and this is Debbie Sanders and, and Nikki Davis, a uh, guy hiding back there, Mike Martin, they're all with my support staff for the EMA. And, we had a staff meeting and I was I was frustrated. I told Keith I was frustrated when I said nobody's showing up for these things. So my people came up with an idea and said, let's do a public survey. And I'll be frank with you, I thought that'd never work. That'd never work. But, but I listened to them, thank goodness. And through their development, Mike and all these people, they were very energetic about developing this survey. And so we prepared a, a survey. We wanted four questions answered. Well, we had a few others like where do, you, where do you live? But we wanted people to tell us what the four main hazards out of the list we had on that survey. And we also put a, a place down at the bottom of the online version where you could put your email address. And I assume that's what brought you some of you citizens here to this meeting today. Uh, we had over 900 people respond to that survey. It was, it was fantastic, and I appreciate that. A lot of good information. Uh, there were a lot of comments. We had a comment section, a lot of good comments. And I'm so proud to see people from the public here today as we do the final step in this plan to send it to publication. Um, I won't, I'm trying not to talk too long here, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, and Keith is going to explain more about what hazard mitigation is and, and why it's important to us. Um, again, we have approximately 900 people. Uh, 
the four major the four major categories uh, for referencing, and I've got the breakdowns by the cities over here. I got them printed out, and I also broke it down by communities. If you live in Jasper Highlands, if you live in Battle Creek, or if you lived in, in New Hope, it, we also have the data for each of those individuals that was broken down. But the survey trend follows the general trend the four main things were severe storms, tornadoes, wildfire, and floods. Uh, the interesting thing on the survey was the number five finisher. FEMA typically looks at the far, top four hazards in your county and I want you to focus on. It. Number five was infrastructure. And the question was geared toward power, water, internet, how you felt, and it was real close to being number four. So a lot of people are concerned, and it tells me that a lot of people are concerned in our county, and we're seeing that in East Tennessee today. Water systems are down, power's been out. There's some people that in North Carolina still don't have power, uh, people that we know personally. So these things are important, and that's part of what we learned in this. Uh, what we did is we took this information to get to this meeting to kind of cons to make it uh, to keep it from being too long. We took that information and we went back and sat down with the city leaders. Uh, Vicki and myself, my, my planner Vicki uh, Davis and I met with the various cities with Keith and some other representatives from Tina. And we said, here's what your citizens are thinking. Because what, what we have to do in this plan is everybody has to pick projects. And Keith's going to explain this more. Everybody has to pick projects that they think they need to do to improve their community. And you should have a list in front of you, either in Jasper or if you're from the county, you have a list. What's shaded yellow on those lists was either completed in the last cycle or, was, or the, the people chose not to put it back yet. Everything that's in white print on those two pages is what we're putting in the updated plan. And I'll be glad to explain more about that later on. Um, but again, I'm glad you're here. This is <laughs> this is amazing to have this many people. Uh, are there any questions before we start? I'm going to turn it over to Keith and let him explain more more detail. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Do we have one of these? Uh, uh, are there any immediate questions from anybody about what hazard mitigation is? I gave you a little flyer sheet that that said information for invitees that gives you kind of an overview of what what's involved. With this. Here comes the mayor. Welcome. <laughs> I see right up front for it. But if anybody, nobody, come on, right up front here. No, I'm sitting up front. Yeah, <laughs> should have been early. I don't know any. <laughs> We're glad to hear it. So, well, if nobody has any questions, then Keith, I'll let you go ahead and, and then I'll come back in later on and explain some stuff on the tail end. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Keith Greenhall. I'm, uh, for those that don't, I haven't met before, I'm prior military, Air Force, retired in 2019. Moved from Alaska to Tennessee. This is my home now. Uh, I live in Bradley County in Cleveland. Um, but I do regional planning for uh, hazard mitigation planning and assisting in uh, basic emergency operation plans for the southeast of Tennessee. So I have 15 counties all the way over uh, to Franklin, up to White County, over to Polk County, and everything in between. So as these cycle through, uh, this is my first year and a half with, with the organization. So. Um, I'm learning a lot, and uh, they, they're all different every time. What I try to focus on is just a little bit of education piece. So informing people this is what happens, and then giving them the, the, the bottom line, this is what actually happens with the projects and things like that. Um, <coughs> but before I go into that, if anyone wants to really quickly look at the um, Just to give you a heads up, this is currently what the situation looks like in East Tennessee. The red places, those are all, that's all disaster uh, related things. And all those little things, the purple, the red, as you can see, is destroyed, major, th that's what happened. And what we're working on right now. So we have a base out of Knoxville, but we have disaster recovery centers being set up in Johnson, Washington, and, and Unicoi. Two of them already are, but we're gonna have, I think, five by, hopefully by the end of the week. And 
and then uh, I'll be out there for the next couple of weeks starting Sunday helping with those, those disaster recovery centers and for those who've never had to do that you know that's great but they involve like everything if you lost your whole house and, and you, you didn't have your license didn't have all those things those things will be available to those people resources money blankets anything that we can do that's what we're doing so just wanted to give you kind of an update that's kind of as of today what it looks like right now of the damage that happened from from Helene. so any questions about that So I already introduced myself and you all know him. Um, we're gonna go over kind of just again, what I already said in mitigation. The new policy guides, it's new to me and it's new to you, but it's really not. It's just, I'm gonna go over the, the intricacies of that just a little bit. Talk about the grants. Um, again, I gave you guys the, the, the handouts and you can, you know, if flooding is something that, that concerns you, you can write something about that that you've personally experienced that helps us write this plan. It helps Steve and myself and his staff to identify what problems you have in your communities because he's not going to know everything, even though he probably does. But um, we miss things, we're human. So that's the idea of collaboration, right? So um, again, that's kind of what we're going to do. Anybody who's been involved in planning or, or anything like that kind of knows the process of what we're doing. Local mitigation planning was updated in uh, April 2023. I started in June 2023. So to me, it was all just brand new. So, um, big highlights, I'll just go over, there'll be a few of them, is climate change. Um, whether we like it or not, it, you know, it, it happens. And it, whether it's because of this or that and politics and all that doesn't really matter. The more people you put in a place like Tampa Bay, if something happens, the more people that have to evacuate and, and possibly be hurt. How you doing? Good morning, Sean. <clears throat> so, hazard mitigation plans subsequently have to be okay. go into more definition on what that means. Targeting your your disadvantaged areas within your communities, which could be your older population area, could be where people only have one car. But there's multiple families and whatever ways it's going to be for emergency personnel to get to them or to get them out that's what we try to look at and address for mitigation purposes <coughs> like, like steve kind of mentioned you try this whole community look so we try and touch as many different uh businesses um everyone you can you can think of that has a duck in the fight we want there if we can whether that's one meeting, I've, I've done one where I've done six meetings over the period of eight months. So it just, for me, it's like, let's get it right, you know, versus let's just write a plan. So those are all kinds of different people we want in the room. And so that used to be the old one, and this is kind of where we focus now is, again, addressing social vulnerabilities within communities is something FEMA pushes highly in the last four years. Last time we talked about high hazard dams, you guys don't have any, um, but it's high on the list. If you had one, we would address it and Steve would let me know and we would have uh, our, under TDEC, Department of Energy and, and Commerce, they have individuals that can go out and check a dam if you have one that's either named or not named. I ran into this in counties where no one knows who owns a certain dam and it's like, well then who's going to fix it because it's leaking. So you have to go back. And, and again, we're, we addressed that already, so we don't have that, but I just wanted to highlight it. So what is hazard mitigation? It's like it says, it's a means of sustained action to mitigate or eliminate some kind of thing that threatens life, agriculture, structures, infrastructure, whatever that may be. What we try to do is prepare against those things where you see something has happened before or where you think it might start happening. The planning is a planning process. We have a planning document. And then, like Steve said, I typically start about 15 months out from the end date. So then I have plenty of time because I right now I'm working on five different plans. So, and they, I try to stagger it and, and spread myself as I can and not do it all in one month. Um, but along that path, we, uh, I think, identifying your vulnerabilities and your threats, like uh, Steve, what are they again? 
flooding, tornado, severe weather. So highlighting the top, severe storms, which again, that, that falls under any kind of thing. So severe storms, you think hail, you think lightning, that starts wildfires, all kinds of different stuff. Um, again, infrastructure, floods, and then tornado. Those, again, you can't, the mitigation you can do against the tornado, build a storm shelter, um, reinforce uh, a building. Um, those types of things are the projects you can do for that. So the planning components right there, it's the process, the risk assessment, which we are, you know, 12 months into it at this point, and uh, developing the mitigation strategy is kind of what we're trying to hone in on. Making sure we're not missing any risks or, or, or threats. That's why you're all here. And I, again, thank you for all being here. And then after we get it all accomplished, then it's a five-year cycle. And what EMA directors do is at the end of the third quarter every year, I'll contact them, they'll contact me, and we'll just say, hey, has anything changed? Is, anything, is your infrastructure changing? Are, are you, did a big development start where it's going to cause flooding in a different neighborhood? Things like that that we can maybe build a culvert with state and federal funds. So those are the things we're looking at. So how it's prepared, again, like I said, 15-month-ish process. Um, and a lot of that's built in because of how long it takes me to get information back from FEMA. They usually have, every time I submit something, they have 45 days. Um, and sometimes that turns into 180 days. So I can't control that except I try to make good relationships with my counterparts and get them on speed dial and say, hey, can you look at that plan? Um, risk assessments, we do that by things like, um, we have jurisdictional uh, questionnaires that I handed out um, <coughs> last time. They're more in depth. It's not a, a thing that I really want people to try and fill out here because it's like seven pages. I'd rather you just gather information, take away from what we can, and then just because we have this meeting today doesn't mean you can't up-channel information to speak to the staff about anything. That's that's the key is this is just letting you know about it. Anything you come up with in mind, he's open to, obviously. So. And then after you, you, you know, you set the risk and you're obviously going to build some kind of a mitigation strategy, right? So <clears throat> cost effectiveness, uh, so FEMA always wanted to prioritize projects. They want each county or jurisdiction to prioritize number one through whatever. Um, I don't care about that personally. I think you just put it all in and then there's lots of money there. So just ask for it and whatever they say they'll give you, then we do that and press forward with it. And I talked about that already. So it's just kind of a cycle. Um, these are all, and I handed this out to you as well, all the different grant programs on here i would highlight the big one i, I really like highlight i've been since i the bottom one it's the FEMA safeguarding tomorrow revolving loan fund which came from a bill in 20 21 i think um called the storm act and, and what that what, what this is is fema's giving will give the state currently we have seven million dollars that was allotted to us that then we can loan out to any county or jurisdiction that has an approved project, let's say that's a generator and it's $50,000, but your city or jurisdiction's budget doesn't really want to do that because they don't have the money. Well, you can get a 10 to 30 year loan, not a personal loan for a person, but the, the city or the, or the entity at 1%, it's capped at 1% and you don't have to pay to start to pay back or accrue interest until the project is complete. So what that allows is flexibility for uh, a county mayor or, or a jurisdiction, whatever that may be, to stretch it over multiple budgets. Then that then their prioritization of you know schools and whatever that may be with their constituents, this is a big help. The problem with it was state governments are great at giving money away, but they're not really set up to give it and then get it back. You know, like a loan process. We don't do that from from our perspective. That's we're not a bank. So that took about a year for us to figure out how we're going to do that by watching other states fail and then finally get it right. And so that's where we are now. It's <coughs> passed through Congress and legislation, so it's, it's enacted in the state of Tennessee. Um, the big thing I will, like the HM, 
PG was the second one, FMA, and BRIC. These are all, the BRIC and the FMA are, I would say, like it's national, right? So every state competes for the money in those pots. Bigger money, maybe 500 million, maybe a billion, but you compete with the state. The HMPG grants are what's allotted to each state. So all you're doing is competing and um, in Tennessee, is, we have 95 counties, so you're competing against the other 95 counties. So Marion County wants to put their priorities and wants to get four generators to, to save a sewage plant, uh, switch uh, station or whatever that may be. Let's do that. But the way it breaks down is the federal government will pay 75% of that project. The state will pay 12.5% of that, and then the, the city jurisdiction or entity then is responsible for 12 and a half. That money is where I was talking about that bottom one. You can utilize that loan for that 12 and half percent and spread that over however many years you want. Any questions about any of that so far? Does it all make sense or am I just, sir? I guess I'll be the troublemaker. Absolutely. How long does it take to get money from any of these programs to the municipality and is it reimbursable or upfront money i mean i don't small little town like mon eagle on a mountaintop may not have severe flooding depending right. on their stormwater ordinance and other factors but the flow of money would be a challenge so if we apply for something when do we see a check so that's the grant process right so <clears throat> well does that apply to your yes. loans as well and yeah so I, I don't write the grants but i I was going to have someone here to talk specifically to that, but because of the disaster, that person has been working every day sure. up in Nashville, and he's the state mitigation officer, and I want him everywhere I go when it because he can explain those more in detail than I can. Mm -hmm. What I will tell you is that it it's federal government, so 12 to 18 months once the pro so you do a pre-application for a project. <coughs> Number one is putting a project in this plan. If it's not in this plan then you can't apply for it for one of these grants. You can apply for it in other grants, Homeland Security, there's other ways to get money, don't get me wrong, but if you want to utilize these grants, it has to be in the plan. That's what we're here for, is establish that. Then, as soon as it's, you know, right now if you have a, if you have something in there, you can apply for it right now. And we're gonna make sure this, this doesn't expire, so anything that's in there, or we add, can be applied for. I would say it's gonna take about three to four months, realistically, from the, the pre-app to the application process. That's done at the state level. State works with whoever, individual, our grant writing people. We've hired like three more in the last 10 months. So we were lacking in that part and we've had frustrations from different communities because we weren't getting them the stuffs two years or something like that. And before my time, but I can't make excuses for it. All I can say is going forward, there's changes now. So realistically, let's just say 18 months from the time you apply to the time you get the money. Now, if it's in there and it's gonna get be approved and you pay up front, then you get reimbursed. If it's not in there at all, and then you're trying to put it in afterwards, then that's where I don't that's the iffy area. Right I'll, I'll touch on this a little more here. I've got some more notes to go over here. Okay. Okay. I just want to know what you I'll kind of do it in the closing here. Okay. Yeah. Timing is important. Yes, it is. I just wanted an overview of that. Thank you. Yep. Um, and this is just like a typical mitigation project. So that's where, on the left, that's a project in Tennessee. I want to say it was Clarksville or Cookville. Um, flooding all the time, and they turned it into a bridge walking area. And you can see in the background. Oh, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> There's a building in the back, and the big thing with uh, structures, if you're, this would be like a repetitive loss, severe repetitive loss area, where they're going to buy the land, turn it into a public thing. So in the back, you can't have any like physical four wall structures. So you've got to have like an open pavilion or something like that. So, and then that's just reinforcing obviously a big liquid tank. Another picture of that, and kind of that was the area that became that. Structural retrofits, um, seismic, not so big in this part of Tennessee. Memphis area, potentially. Um, 
but it's not that they don't happen. They're just they're not high on the priority for people because it doesn't happen often. I grew up in Southern California, and then spent ten years in the military in Alaska. So I know all about earthquakes and tsunamis. So hurricanes and tornadoes and everything. That's what I'm getting used to down here. So, um, let's see. so some examples of you know building a culvert, enlarging the culvert. So you just expand it, make it bigger because guess what? More more rain's coming from wherever that part of the mountain or whatever is coming down. Um, safe spaces, so tornado safe space. So building one individually or adding on to something or adding in to, let's say, a community center and you want to build a room that's actually safe in there. Those are things that can be done and money for the project also includes money for uh, any kind of study, geologic study, any kind of building study, um, historical studies, every building that we touch with federal funds has to be vetted that it's not a historical building, and if it is, they gotta go through all those loopholes of why can't you put a pole on the side of one for the siren. So, you know, those are things that are all covered as far as costs go. Um, and then I would say, I think your town, your school, is there anyone here for schools? No, no, no. but they, they, they've got safe, it's part of the project is to try to retrofit every school. And, and the Homeland Security, which I fall under as well, um, we all under that, but they have separate so money for that to make reinforced windows and doors. But we can offer through ours is 3M film that can sustain high winds, which can also stop you know someone from trying to break glass. It's not going to stop someone from with an AR weapon shooting 20 bullets in their butt. It's, it's, a, it's a way, if you can't get the money for that kind of thing, another avenue to help protect our children. So two years ago, backup generators weren't part of uh, a mitigation um, project that you could apply for. So now that it is, it's a huge thing. And for me, when I sit down, I try to, I want to talk to the building people. I talk to the, anybody who's involved with any of the infrastructures like your uh, which sewage plant you're talking about to sell to sell to I'll uh, just give you an example yeah. that in, in the city of Kimball there's a lift station that actually belongs to to South Pittsburgh sewer system. That lift station goes down, basically that whole interchange, all those stores are going to close because there'll be no place for the sewers to go. I'd say that's a pretty big impact for all of us. So that's what that's what we're alluding to when we talk about backup for pumping stations. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Jasper Highlands is the only water system we have that has 100% pumping stations to get their water to the top of the mountain. They have backup generators. All these other communities, I know, Mayor, you're working on, on stuff uh, outside of the plan to, to retrofit, and so, but this is something that's a 